Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I don't say that this, uh, this morning flippantly. Um, for just a second, I'd like you to bear with me as I talk about the word Christmas. Greek word Christos, Christ. Translates Messiah. Translates the anointed one. Mass is Latin for the Eucharist or the the communion, we would call it in our church. But the Eucharist, so it's anointed Eucharist. And it's so important that we understand this because because we've already talked about it, is the fact is, is that because of the Lord's Supper, because of what Jesus teaches about this is my body broken for you, in other words, we can have healing because of this, right? And because of the blood that is shed, we can have forgiveness of sins. Can I get an amen? Therefore, when we say anointed Eucharist during the year, in this time of season, what are we at? What are we saying? We are giving God glory for the gifts that he has given us. And I don't know about you, but that's important. Because as I see the world as it is as of right now, um, let me give you some words to describe it. Attitudes of people. Um, just the words. Um, doom, gloom, heaviness. Would you agree with me? Or am I just... Or is it just because of where I'm at right now? But I'm with Mary, and I stand in agreement with you, sister, because I am, um, I'm angry. I'm going to be honest. I'm angry at the devil. I'm mad. I'm tired. Guys, enough is enough in the body of Christ, okay? I'm just, I'm, that's where I'm at. And, and so as we walk through these things together and over this next year, I, I sit there, and I said today in, in our connection class, I said, I don't know how people do life without God. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I can't figure it out how we can even go because <clears throat> this morning we're going to step away from First uh, Peter. I will finish First Peter. I promise there's some powerful stuff at the end of this book. But I really, over the next couple weeks, I'm going to shock you and do something a little bit traditional. What? I'll stand back. I want to talk to you I'm not going to do traditional Advent. Don't go crazy, okay? Come on now. But I'm going to talk to you a couple weeks about some things about it. Is that okay? So today I've entitled this The Hope of Christmas. Because I need some hope. I'm just being honest. You ever have a day that starts out bad? Yeah, well, if they're this morning. This is how my life has gone to this morning. But I can't do it without God. I can't, I can't do it without hope. And so as, I, as, as the Lord has kind of changed this and, and gave me some scripture, and I was like, okay, I've read this to you before in another study, but I'm going to read you the definition of hope. Is that okay? And, and it's out of the uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary, the only dictionary we should probably use. I'm just saying. It says hope. It's a noun. A desire of some good accompanied with at least a slight expectation of attaining it or a belief that it is obtainable. Hope differs from wish and desire in this, that it implies some expectation of obtaining the good desired or the possibility of possessing it. Hope, therefore, always gives pleasure and joy, whereas wish and desire may, be, may produce or be accompanied with pain and anxiety. Definition. That's why I say this is the one we need to use. It also could mean a confidence in a future event, the highest degree of well-founded expectation of good as hope founded in God's gracious promises and scripture in a scriptural sense. That which gives hope, he or that which furnishes ground of expectation or promises desired good, the hope of Israel is in the Messiah. You see, this is why we come and this is why we gather. This is why we need a family because when we are not in that understanding and guess what? Us believers who have walked this, have, we've lost hope at times. We've gotten angry at times. I'm so glad one of my favorite scriptures in your anger, do not sin. That means I can be angry but I gotta be careful what I do in that anger, amen? 
And so as we, as we understand, it's like we need one another. Mary talked about it, and, and, and Chad talked about this. I mean, it's just the way everything is put together. This is a God-anointed thing for us today and for what we need to hear. It's because I don't know about you, but we need some hope. We need some Jesus. We need some um, Messiah. We need some anointed Eucharist. We, we, need, we, we need to somehow find within us the hope of Christ's birth, which points us to his death, which points us to his resurrection, which points us to our resurrected from being dead spiritually, but being alive in Christ, not being, not being uh, held and contained by the laws, but being loved and supported by his grace. So if you got your sword, if you got your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. That is a traditional scripture used during this part of the year, by the way. Um, and I'm reading out of the Holman uh, translation, which I normally do. Sometimes I go back and forth, but I'm, I'm there. It says... Nevertheless, the first in the Holman, it says nevertheless. And when I, when I was reading that, when you see words like therefore or nevertheless or whatever, it forces you to say nevertheless what? And so you got to go looking for it. You got to go, you got to, okay, what's going on? So in chapter 8, so I'm going to give you a little background. In chapter 8, it's a prophecy of a coming invasion by Assyria to Israel. It's not a good thing. It's a battle. It's, it's, it's <laughs> when Assyrians came in, they came in with a flood and they weren't merciful and they did their thing. And so this is his prophecy. And in the middle of this, at the end of chapter eight, starting in verse 18, I'm just gonna read this. That's not my main passage, but I want you to understand where we're coming from in order for this to make any sense of what we're gonna read. But it says, here I am with the children the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So the author is saying, I am with the people that God has given me. And in the middle of all this, what is coming, there will be things going on. And they use the word signs and wonders. There'll be things going on that proves that God is still in Israel. But when they say to you, consult spirits of the dead and the spiritualists, and, they, and in other words, they say, when you look for things outside of God, when people say, you know what, God's not your answer, it's everything else, that we need to dig in. We know, we, the, he knew Assyria was coming, he knew a battle was raging. And I begin to think about this, and I, you need to understand, this is not a doom and gloom. I'm, I hope at the end of the day we are so full of joy and hope and we are just like ready to take on anything the enemy throws at us because we need to be there. Dead bones needs to rise. The army of the Lord needs to rise. It is time for the church to be the church that God has created us to be. And I'm not just speaking about this body. I'm talking about the Western culture and church that has been asleep for too long that needs to wake up and I'm calling them out and that's why we're on. Thank you for all you at home. But this is what I'm talking about. And I believe if I go and, and next week and I do a Google search of the sermons that I believe there is many, many, many pastors saying the exact same words because that happens way too often. So he knew this was coming. They knew this was going through and he's saying all these things and when people say, and I don't know about you, but I hear this all the time, oh, your hope's got to be in something else. Your hope's got to be in your job. Your hope's got to be in your paycheck. Your hope's got to be in this. Your hope's got to be in that. I won't go there. Your hope is in the politics. Your hope's in, in whatever, whatever. Okay, no, I'm going to go there. The hope is in the vaccine. No, it's the hope is not in the vaccine. The hope is in God anyway. Whether God says to you to get the vaccine, great, get it, if that's what God's telling you to do, because if you don't, you're disobedient. But so he may be telling you not to. But what I'm saying is, is the hope is not there. The hope is in God. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't get it. Uh, trust me, I'm probably going to get some emails. But listen, what I'm saying is, is that our hope can't be placed on anything but God. God is the only truth we have. And so, 
So when I'm reading this and I'm seeing this and I see what people are always trying, there's a phrase that's on TV a lot on commercials. Now, I don't have like a regular, I just have over-the-air TV, and it has to do with um, Medicare, and it drives me nuts. It says, I'm getting everything that I deserve. I'm telling you what, man, blood begins to boil because I tell you what we deserve, what I deserve. But God's grace and mercy showed up and said, no, I've covered that. When I stand in front of God, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be things that I'm going to have to answer for, but at the same time, God Jesus is going to stand as my advocate and my lawyer and say, "Father, judge, holy one, uh, remember, my blood covered this." And so our hope's got to be in this. So it says, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land. Hello. Sounds like this was written for us today. I feel like I've been in a distressed land. I feel like I've tasted and seen some gloom. Seems like sometimes it's hard not to grab onto that and ride that out, amen? Nevertheless, in this gloom of the distressed land, it will not be like that of former times. And then it goes on to say, when he humbled the land of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali, talking about another war that took place, which must be, which must have been even greater devastation than what was going to happen, because he goes, that's not how it's going to be. And that was between Syria and Ephraim. which I believe almost wiped out the whole tribe of of Ephraim, the whole nation state. (laughs) He said, even though you're in this, it is not going to be like former times. Why? Because it says, but in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to the Galilee of nations. It is speaking of the birthplace of Jesus. The way of the sea. That, that, that's what they call the, 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 the way in which the trade went in front of Jerusalem, the, the trade routes. It's, it's this whole thing, but it's, he's saying, in this time, instead of the humbling of this, I am gonna honor this. And what does that mean for us? Because it's, oh, that's great, that's in the, but what does that mean for us? Well, you see, I don't know about you, but the way I've studied it, and you know me, I'm really big into my Jewish roots, not that I'm Jewish, but that I serve a rabbi by the name of Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus my Messiah, I'm grafted in. And so when I read this, it's not that I take their place. I definitely don't believe in the, I don't take their place. They're still God's chosen. Oh, and by the way, I do believe that God still fulfills the promise of his first covenant. But I will tell you this, I'm grafted in. And I praise God for it because in, I can take this passage of scripture and I can say in the land when we feel, it's not land, how about my territory? You guys remember the old, the, the old prayer of Jabez? Lord, increase my territory. A territory where I have influence. My family, my job, my school, my church, my neighborhood, the gas station, the grocery store. Where I have that. So when you start reading scripture, my territory, where I have influence. And I'm going to tell you this. You do have influence whether you think you do or not. You're either going to have influence for light or you're going to have influence for darkness. And I will, we'll get into that in a minute. But he says, in those things, we are set in that position. We are set. God says he's going to honor where we're at. Why? See, the why is this, and the, or the for what is this, is that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You see, when I look at this and I begin to see that a lot of people in, 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 in my sphere of influence and where I can be, I see a lot of people walking in darkness, just like back in the time. In, in what's written that there's all this darkness going on, but he's starting to refer to a light that shines in that darkness. And yes, he's talking about the birth of Jesus. Matter of fact, it says this is the birth of the Prince of Peace. But it's, he's talking about this, and he's like, there's this great light, and God has revealed to us, and this is why I believe this ties in with the year of testimony, because we are to be a great light in the f- area in which we influence. 
We're not the great light, but we are to reflect the great light. And so, and it says, so listen, where we step, there has to be revelation of who Jesus is. Not who the Lighthouse Church is. But who Jesus is. So, it goes on in that lesson, it says, the light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. So there is a great light that people see as they are walking, walking in darkness. Let's look at it this way. That word can be uh, translated as a journey or way of life. The way of life. Most, most people who don't know the Lord have a way of life of darkness, even if they're good people. That's what the Bible says. But, because they see a great light and a light has dawned on, and, and the, the picture I got was like, we homeschool our kids. We homeschooled our kids. I guess we still are. We've got one we're still working on. He's almost done. Praise the Lord. Um, but what I, what, I, what I saw when I was thinking about this is that light bulb moment when they got it. But then as a pastor, I see light bulb moments I have a privilege to see those on occasion from doing this. I see light bulb moments on the faces of people when they get it, when they get something new and it's like a dawn. <gasps> oh, oh, I've been real vocal about my struggle with understanding that God loves me as much as he can love you. You know, I've been very vocal about that. Like this is where God's been teaching me. Like I, I, I need to receive that love from him right? When I got that understanding, it was like a birth of a brand new day. Because I'm like, oh, wow. So, he, whoa, he really, lo- like, he, he doesn't look at my performance. He looks at my heart. I don't test very well. I never did in school. Praise the Lord that God doesn't grade with tests. Now, some people, it says he tests us, but yeah, but a lot of times is the, the answer to the question is simply this, God, I can't do this. You better do it. You better answer it. I hadn't studied. <laughs> if you're in school, you've prayed that a lot. <laughs> but what does God do? You don't need to study. I got it. Not that we don't have to do what we need to do, okay? I'm not saying that, but, but it's, not, it's not forced on me to have every answer. It's not forced on me to know all the right things. It's not... It's not forced on me to have to do the, the, all I have to do is my next right thing, right? So we're supposed to be this dawn, right? We're supposed to be this light. Romans 13, I'm gonna jump around a bit. Um, I'm gonna try to do everything I can to keep within time. Romans 13, let's jump down to verse 11. Now I'm going to read just a section of verses, but I encourage you to go home and read around it, please. It says, starting in verse 11, besides this, besides what? But besides doing our next right thing with love being our primary duty, that's kind of what it's getting at, okay? But besides this, knowing the time, let's not get all crazy about, oh, end time thing. No, knowing the time in which you're in right now. Knowing the, uh, knowing the circumstance in which you stand or the thing in which you're facing, the giant in which is in front of you, right? He said, uh, knowing the time, is, is it already the hour for you to wake up from sleep? Isn't that like a dawn? Wake up. No matter where you're at, wake up and look, for now your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. Your rescue from that situation, or the, uh, or the ending of it, or the understanding of it, or the, or the desire to walk through it is right there. It's nearer than when we first believed. That's powerful to me, because when I first became a believer, man, I mean, I had all this faith, and then I lived life, and it seemed like, I'm going to be honest with you, it seems like the church choked the faith out of me until I really met. Like, it's not that I didn't know Jesus, but then I met him for different, and not only that, then Holy Spirit got involved. And I was able to walk in ways that I've never walked before. I was able to do things that I'd never done before. 
And, and that didn't mean I was like Superman leaping over buildings and stuff, but like when a storm came against me, I could stand without fear. But then I went through a period after that that I had feared. But then God says, great, now I'm gonna strengthen you even more. It wasn't that he was punishing me. It was that he was, in, he was investing in me as a father invests in a son. And if you didn't grow up with a good father, because that happens, there's no excuse. You're still being fathered by God. And you're still loved. And you're still cared for. So, so it's time to wake up, because guess what? The night is nearly over. Church, I got this word for our church. The night is nearly over. I got that for the Crawfords. I got that for the Luddens. I got that for the Roberts. The night is nearly over. And the daylight is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daylight, not carousing or drunkenness or sexual impurity or promiscuity, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. That speaks to the heart. Don't plan on it. Don't live or walk in darkness, but be that reflection. The armor of light is just simply, the way I look at it, is God's armor. You know, in Ephesians, it says put on the full armor of God. It is God's armor, not our own. And it's all shiny and polishy because we're just reflecting. The armor of light is simply doing my next right thing. And you know what? That next right thing may be the smallest of a smile to somebody. Or maybe it's a Merry Christmas. An anointed Eucharist for you. Do you see the power in that? I said it before, I don't think the church blesses people enough. And I don't mean giving, I mean speaking blessing because we speak life or death. And I think sometimes when we, God's given us a blessing for somebody to say, Lord, bless you and keep you, then what we're doing is actually not by not speaking, we're speaking. We need to learn to bless. We need to learn. You talk about a greatest gift because that's what Jesus did. All right, so we're going to flip back to Isaiah chapter 9. Oh. Next section, and I'm going to read this big section here real quick. But I need you to hear it in light of what I talked to you already about territory, okay? It says, you have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at harvest time, as they rejoiced with dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke, the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressors, just as you did in the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. This is God asking God to come in and what the enemy meant for evil, God, we believe you're gonna turn it for good. And matter of fact, those things, when we go to battle one, when we, we're battling and we're in there against the, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it's not we're not battling here. We're battling in the spiritual realm by doing our next right thing, man. That's, that's, that's battling. And so as we're battling this and we're doing this, God is increasing our territory and those things that we thought were lost become fuel for a blazing fire that spreads. Through it. We call that um, revival. We call that testimony being seen and fulfilled. And it's like, that's what God wants to do. You know where we see this again in the New Testament? Uh, real quick, 1 John chapter 5. Because this to me is, is, is what it's talking about. When we, when we testify, when, when, when we, we just say what God is doing, when we, when we, we do our next right thing, we're, we're testifying and says, now this is the message that we've heard from him, this is in verse five, and declare to you, God is light. The one that lives in you is light. The one that's taken up residence in you is light, okay? There is absolutely no darkness in him. That means, if you think about it, if we're walking in him like we should, that means the darkness that sometimes comes over us actually can't stay because I've got a light inside of me and darkness never overcomes light. Light always overcomes darkness. 
Science, not biblical. That's science. Darkness is the absence of light. So if you have light, you can't have darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and we are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we look at these passages of scripture in light of what it's saying, it's that this is how we grow the kingdom of God is by the power of the testimony of what God is doing within us. It's not about knowing verse and script, like I know, well, Rev, he's a guy that he, he spoke here before. I go to Bible study, he leads it. And I'm telling you, like, he has so much scripture in his head. And I've walked with Jesus a long time, and I've gone through the Bible a lot and, and whatever, and I know it, but I can't give you, like, and he'd get up here and say he's not any good at it, but I sit there and I go, Are you computer? You know, because he just, I'm not saying we don't need to. Memorize, I think it's important. I think we should try. And, and the reason we do that is because there's going to be a time and a battle in which we're facing that God is trying to increase our territory. And we're not losing because we don't lose if we're walking in light. But what happens is, 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 is we start to get discouraged. And then all of a sudden God will pop up a scripture. I don't know about that first John. If we, have, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And it talks about the blood of Jesus forgiving us of all sins. Do you know how encouraging that is, is, especially when I've just messed up? You ever been there? Where you know maybe your heart was in the right place, but your mouth was not? And then all of a sudden, God reminds you, I'm faithful and just. I've forgiven you of your sin. Now forgive yourself and move on. Do the next right thing. A lot of times the next right thing is apology or a confession of one's sin. But in most of the time, sometimes God's just like, move on. We forget passages and promises like when he forgives us, it is as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember. There's a passage that says he doesn't remember our failures. That means when he sees you, he sees you as clean and holy and righteous because the blood of Jesus is all he sees. And not only that, then he puts a little dose of Holy Spirit on top so that we walk in this, in this understanding, this light. Because listen, why is all this important? for a child will be born for us. Holman says for us. Oh, come on. Other translations where a child is born to us. Man, I like the for. Because that's like for me. For you. That tells me that even if you were the only one, he would have still done what he did. That's how important you are to him. That's how important the situation that you see, that you think is so, he sees it and he knows it and he wants to take care of it. And he may not care, take care of it the way you would have done it. Praise God because your way is probably a little flawed because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. How many have had that argument with God when you're trying to counsel God on how to fix something? Do you know I love it because God listens and says I'll take it under advisement but I'm going to do what I need to do. Because I know you. For, for unto us, a, a, for us, a child is born. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And a lot of people have taken some of this stuff out of context. When it says the government will be on his shoulders, he's responsible. 
he's also can refer back to Israel and David, and I mean, you could go you go a lot of different ways here. But when I look at it, it's like I do believe that God. It's like, look, I don't. I think it is telling us, and maybe this is simple, but I got to be simple because I know me. Maybe it's saying, will you rest your government on His shoulders? The way you think things should be, will you put it on his shoulders instead of your own? Because sometimes it's like, that's what I'm here for, but we say, no, nah, God, you got enough on your plate, I'll handle it for you. And then you start reading this, and his name will be wonderful. When I look at this, I look at three names here, not f- four? Yeah, not four, I look at three. The reason is, is because first of all, what I see here is him speaking of the power in which we live, which is in the power of the Trinity or the Holy Spirit. It says this, the wonderful counselor, what did Jesus say? A comforter will come, a counselor will come, right? So he's part of that Trinity, he's part of that three in one, he's saying that's it. And then mighty God, eternal father is the same to me. It's saying he's not only a mighty God, but he's my eternal father. So he's speaking of God the Father. And then he says, what? what's the next one? Prince of Peace, who is that? That's Jesus. Isaiah is sitting here saying, and I know the word Trinity never shows up in the Bible, but it sure speaks of it. It's in Genesis and it's in here. And he's saying, listen, I'm giving you everything in order to increase your territory because people are in darkness and they need to see, they need to have a revelation of light and they need to increase the territory, your territory, the kingdom of God. Because see, when I turn my stuff over to God, it's not my territory anymore, it's his. It's not my money anymore, it's his. It's not my family anymore, it's his. It's not my church anymore, it's his. It's not my nation anymore, it's his. You see, I, 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 I say I'm just an ambassador in this place. I am not of this world, but I'm in it. And, and, and so when we do that, it's, it's all his. And, and, and if we give him all of that, and, and then it says this in seven, and the dominion will be vast and the prosperity will never end and he will reign on the throne of David or his kingdom uh, is established and sustained. There you go. As I sit here, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, listen, if we put him in the proper place, if we allow Holy Spirit to be the comforter and the counselor, if we realize that we have a mighty God who is above all and, and, and all that stuff, but he is still a loving eternal father. If we realize that and then we understand that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life for he did came into the world not to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved or I say that through him the world can be rescued. Maybe we need to take this more personally and say, Lord, I want you to have vast dominion within me. I want you to rule and reign. I want the prosperity, not the, uh, the prosperity of the world, because that is totally different than this prosperity. Because I know a lot of people who love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, love their neighbors as their selves, and they still live day to day. So when we think of prosperity, please drop money. Because I'd rather be rich of love and mercy and grace than with a pocket full of bills. I'm just being honest. I mean, I got a pocket full of bills, but not the other bills. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Do you see what I'm getting at, though? That maybe... uh, Maybe even the body of Christ, we come with an agenda that's not of God. Not be wrong, but not of God. Maybe the body of Christ needs to wake up to the fact and say, you know what, God, you actually can have dominion in my church. So leaders of our church, I'm asking you, have you given it over to him or are you still trying to control? I had to ask myself that this week. So I'm not asking you anything that I haven't asked myself. Fathers, I'm asking you, are you letting God have dominion over your family or are you still trying to have control? Mothers, same question. Employees, same question. Employers, same question. 
because he has come into the world. The child has been given. Jesus has come for us so that he can have dominion and power and we give it back to him. I know the Bible says when we get to heaven, we're going to have all these crowns and stuff. I hate when church preaches on that because I'm like, it also says we give it back. In other words, the reward, that thing is not important. The reward is the relationship. It's putting away the religion and bringing forth the relationship, which is intimate in knowledge of who he is. And that means you're allowing him into every part of your life. He knows it anyway. You might as well just do it surrendered. It's easier. Because it's going to get to you. Are you letting him rule? Are you allowing him to establish you? And not only to establish you and what you do and where you put your hand and where your feet go and what your mouth says, are you allowing him to sustain you through the stuff that's hard? Mary talked about it. That's huge. Because we need some sustaining power. Man, I was thinking, Mary. Yeah, me too, I'm with you. Like, come on, God. Chop, chop. But after I think about it, I'd rather have a sustaining power. I really would. I mean, both are great. But the sustaining power, because it's writing our testimony. Sometimes what we go through is not for us. Sometimes what we're going through is so that we are an example of others. Jesus went to the cross not for himself, but for us. Pick up your cross daily and follow him, it says. Don't ask why me, ask why not me. Instead of hiding and cowering from chaos that we see, run towards it and be the light. These are all things I've said before, but God's brought back to my memory because I think maybe I needed to hear it. This is hard. See, God's going to reign with justice and righteousness from now on and forever, whether you want him to or not. I do believe that there's going to come a point in which God's going to show up and he's going to rule and reign, and if they didn't want him too bad because he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Is it going to happen? I don't know, and I don't care. My hope is that it's going to, because, man, this is about the hope of Christmas. And it says, in the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, the zeal of God. The, the, what is the word zeal? We, it's the tenacity, maybe. I looked it up because I was like, what, is, what does it mean? How about this? Jealousy, fervor, and passion. He is jealous for you. He is jealous for your neighbor. Not in the unholy jealousy that we have, but in a holy jealousy. In other words, I want relationship with these people. I want them to want to have a relationship with me. Because I think it would be all easier if he just made us all robots. It would be so much easier. You know what I'm saying? Take the decision out of my head, cause, but then what good would it be? What's good is that I have a relationship and a passion that my God loves me and he is willing. He has a fervor for me. He will continue to chase after me. Do you know he does that for your neighbor or that unwanted family member? It's Christmas time. We have to talk about that. He's jealous for them too. You may not be. And I need to tell you that's okay. As the Lord leads, he will change you in order for you to be that reflection that you need to be. And sometimes a reflection is dim. Think about the stars. They're pretty bright close, but by the time they get to us, they're just a little twinkle. Sometimes that's all we can be, just that little bit, because it's not our job to light it up, it's his. The fire of revival cannot happen by what we do, but can only be happened because we're surrendered to it. Man, you can come up, uh, uh, team, sorry. I, I also want to read another passage out of Isaiah. And 
Because see, I think our job is we're, we're here talking about having hope of, of, of an anointed Eucharist. That's, you know, we're supposed to have this hope. But we're also supposed to give hope. See, what, uh, isn't the saying goes, what good is a gift if you don't ever give it away? You know what a gift is if you don't give it away? It's called a possession. God doesn't want us to possess those things. He wants to give those things. This is why he gives us spiritual gifts, not because we're supposed to hold it on, it's because actually because we're supposed to give them away. We gotta learn how to give them away in the proper space, in the proper time. But that's why he's given it to us. And I just thought I was going to read this because I thought maybe this would make some sense for us. Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly. I'm going to change some words. You can go back in. I'm not adding or taking away, okay? That's, from, that's for the book of Revelations. I'm just saying, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to your people and announce to your people that the time for the forced labor is over. That's freedom, y'all. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. People look at the scripture and say, oh, well, we, get, we don't do anything. No, we actually, I believe, roll up our sleeves and we dig in a little deeper in what we do, not because we have to, but because we can't help it. But the time of the forced labor is over. That's a desire that I want to do it. You know, there's a difference between work and a hobby is one you like and one you don't. If you ever have a hobby that you make into a business, guess what? It becomes work, and it doesn't become a hobby much anymore. See, I wonder if that's what's happened to our relationship with Jesus Christ. We've, we've made it into work instead of something we love to do, something we love to walk into. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and we have received from the Lord's hand double for their sin. We have paid for it. It is done because of Jesus. A voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight the highway for the God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I don't know what valley you're in. I don't know what mountaintop you think you're on. And I don't know what it's a little rough place that you're tripping over. But I believe that God has given us a promise that if we surrender and do what he has called us to do, if we have the hope in Christmas, if we reflect his light, that he has promised to smooth that out. Notice it's smooth. Notice it's not up and down. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be hardships and struggles. It means the way we respond to it is with the hope of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's what we needed to hear this morning. Maybe that's what I needed to hear. Maybe that's what I needed to say. Maybe you've been at a point and you're struggling with something in your life. We've got people struggling. We've got people battling. We got, the enemy is on fire and he's just going out, but there has been a standard that has been raised this morning against that. We are in agreement. And it may not be health, it may be work, it may be family, it may be dealing with loss, it may be new relationships. Maybe old relationships. God cares. And there's hope in them. There's grace in them. There's an empowerment for you to be the reflection and light of Jesus Christ. But we gotta, we gotta take off the deeds of darkness, y'all. And for some of us, it doesn't look like the others. Like for some of us, it's not quitting doing something. Sometimes it's stop thinking something. Sometimes it's stop speaking something. For most of us, it's taking self out and putting God in. Are we going to reflect or are we not? You see, either we react or we respond. Either we reflect or we damage. Because if we're not giving light, 
we're given death. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're encouraged to be life givers. We're going to sing this song. I want to open the altars. I mean, they're always open. I don't know why we say that. You know, we say the stupidest things at church. We just do. Altars are always open. Oh, and by the way, these are just made of wood and carpet. They're nothing special. It's just a place. It's a place to remember. It's a place to lay aside. It's a place to actually, do you know what an altar really is? It's a place of testimony. Because see, when, when God gave them the, the thing to, hey, take the rocks out of the Red Sea when they cross and make this altar, and so why? Was so that when your kids saw them and they said, why is that pile of rocks there? You would give them a testimony of what God did. That's all these altars are for. I'm really big on them because I think we need to come up and we need to say, guess what? Hey, you know, remember when we, our church went through that, I'm just going to say it, pardon me, hell of the last three years? Guess what? God showed up anyway, and he was here, and grace, and mercy fell, and power, and the gifts of the Spirit, and we grew, and we, maybe not in number, but we grew in faith, and the devil was scared of us, and when we walked past people, our shadows, healing went through them, because God was here. Children, this is God's house. Man, we can have an altar here. We can have altars at home. We need to have altars at work. Let us stand. Let us, if you need some hope, if you're struggling, if you've got some stuff, these altars are for you. We want to lay hands on you and we want to pray for you. But I want you to know you don't need us to do that. You have the authority and the power within yourself to come in here and say, God, I surrender. Let's stop trying to do it ourselves and finally do what we're supposed to do. Live surrendered, hands held high, walking in victory because Jesus is the hope of Christmas. Amen? As the Lord leads. Come on.